Thank you, Maxie. <clears throat> Penny and I have learned to love Maxie and Fran, known them for about 15 years. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak to you, and I came personally with the idea of encouraging Christians here just as much as I could with the one hope. Spoke to Foy forehand uh, earlier today, and uh, he saw my tie. It's got lions on it. And he said, I like your tie. I'll wrestle you for it. <laughs> now, with my size and weight, he hasn't got a hope. You know. <laughs> That's what I want to talk about, hope. I love Foy as well. He's a good man. <clears throat> In, the, <clears throat> In the 70s, Anne Murray had a hit song. And, and let me just clear up one, one thing, because I don't want you to ask me to sing. Actually, Maxie made a mistake. It was playing the guitar, and um, I can play the guitar as fast as Johnny Ramsey can speak. <laughs> I want you to know that. In the, late, in the 70s, Anne Murray had this great hit, uh, hit song that uh, uh, showed how the world was viewed, and, and I think how it's viewed a lot by a lot of people today. Rolled out this morning, kids had the morning news show on. Brian Gumbel was talking about the fighting in Lebanon. Some senator was squawking about the bad economy. It's going to get worse, you see. Need a change of policy. There's a local newspaper wrapped up in a rubber band. One more sad stories, one more than I can stand. Just once, I like to see the headlines say, Not much to print today. Can't find nothing bad to say. Nobody robbed a liquor store on the lower part of town. Nobody OD'd. Nobody burned a single building down. Nobody fired a shot in anger. Nobody had to die in vain. I sure could use a little good news today. And perhaps that song reflected how people felt at that time. And perhaps that even permeates society today as well. The masses have lost hope. Many have given up and resorted to savagery and violence because they don't see an answer to their dilemma in the world. Many people feel hopeless today. They look hopeless. They talk hopeless. They have no job, but they've got bills to pay. They fear bankruptcy. They've got no credit. They're sick and afraid, and they're afraid of being sick. And many churches, like marriages, are just existing some, some people feel also that they've gone too far with sin. They feel hopeless. On top of that, we Americans know we've got the greatest deficit any country has ever known. It could float many countries if we took that amount. Statistics from 92 reveal that Texans, more Texans were killed by guns in Texas than Texans were killed in the Vietnam War. And now AIDS threatens to kill many people. I don't know if you know this, but in some African countries, in one particular one, I understand that 50% uh, of that nation have AIDS. Not 5%, 50%. Where I come from, 20% of the nation have AIDS. The government says 10%, but I think they're hiding the figures. In, in America, about 100 people per day died in 1995 due to AIDS. And so people are looking for hope. But I want to tell you with God there is always hope. And I want to look at it in two ways quickly. Firstly, from the practical every day today application. And secondly, from the eternal hope that we have as Christians. On the day-to-day -day basis, you know, Daniel was uh, thrown into the lion's den, but God delivered him. The disobedient were banished to Babylon but God bailed them out. Christ was crucified on a cross, but God crowned him king of kings. Peter and Paul were imprisoned, but they were paroled by God to preach the gospel powerfully. So we must never give up hope on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can tell you when I was in Africa, and I was looking for communists among the wild animals, and they were some of them, um, I, I, I never lost hope. Because I believe in God. And I believe that God got me through that. And I hope for a purpose. And I hope I'm fulfilling some of that purpose. But you know, we're just not equipped to foretell the future. We just don't know what's going to happen from one moment to the next. And so we need to hold on to the hope that God gives us. 
I want to tell you a story about Richard Vavro, who was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. Actually, that's where my dad was born. In a few months after his birth, his parents observed that there was a problem with him. He did not respond normally. It was discovered early that he had an IQ of 30. He was legally blind, mentally retarded, diabetic, and autistic. While his parents were devastated, people said, put him in an institution. They said no. They refused to give up hope. At the age of six, he was taken to an occupational center for that kind of child. And uh, one day, quite by accident, he was left with a, a crayon and a piece of paper. And uh, when they came back, uh, a picture emerged. And its quality was so good, uh, they were shocked. So they let him try again. And they took it to evaluation uh, with, with an artist who really had some say in these affairs. And he said it's much too advanced for a boy of Richard's age and condition. From that day onward, his art began to appear in Europe and America and sells for up to 2,000 a picture. And he has become one of the best contemporary artists with oil-bound crayon in the world. Remember, he had an IQ of 30, legally blind, mentally retarded, diabetic, and autistic. We don't need to give up hope, and we don't need to take hope from people. I don't want to be that person in a person's darkest hour to take away their hope. I want to be realistic, but I'm not going to take away their hope. There is always hope in the darkest of situations, folks, and there is always, always, always hope with God. We're getting close to the cure for Parkinson's disease. Genes are being discovered, it seems, almost on a monthly basis now uh, that, that show that we're on the trail to possibly curing ov ovarian cancer, colon cancer, and a host of other diseases. On a more serious scale, many marriages have problems, but there are no unsolvable problems in marriages, only people who refuse to solve problems. There's even... Hope for churches in a rut. You know, the Lord doesn't want us to wring our hands. He wants us to ring doorbells. He wants us to ring out the good news. But don't let's just sit there and wring our hands because where God is, there is always hope. Ephesians 4.4 4 is the text for the lesson. God is a God of hope. Hope means there. To anticipate, usually with pleasure, with expectation, confidence. There's a definite expectation associated with hope that eliminates doubt. Now remember in, in uh, Acts chapter 2 when Peter was talking about David prophesying of Christ. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exulted. Moreover my flesh also will abide in hope. Acts 2 verse 26. He looked ahead, verse 31 says, and spoke, ahead, spoke of the resurrection of Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Now, Jesus uh, was not lying there in the tomb, and I don't want to be irreverent here, but with his fingers crossed, he knew that he was going to be resurrected. My flesh also will abide in hope. I'm going to be resurrected. Confident expectation. And the same goes for Acts chapter 16 when Paul's in Philippi and being followed by that demon-possessed slave girl. When her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. Acts 16 verse 19. There was no doubt in their minds that their ability to gain money, procure money through this girl's uh, demon, there was no doubt in their minds that it was gone. Their hope before that was a very real one. It was an assured one. It was a proven one. We don't possess some magical mystery because of Christ. We've got a powerful promise. Paul was held in chains for his hope. When he was before the Sanhedrin, he perceived that one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees. Paul was crafty here. Divide and conquer. 
Paul, he began crying out, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. He knew that was a bone you could throw in front of those two dogs and they're going to fight all day. And then he says, And now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I'm being accused by Jews. And then he says, why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? We've got a very real hope. Later on, he appeals to the Jews in Rome and he says, For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and speak with you, for I'm wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. Acts 28 verse 20. There was no doubting his earnest expectation of the resurrection. We Christians share one hope, just one hope, that's it. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. And the one body and the one spirit correspond to this one calling. Paul is saying here, just as your calling resulted in one hope, so there is only one body and one spirit. We've not been called by many spirits to God. We've been called by one spirit. We've not been called into many bodies. We have been called into one body. Colossians 3.15 We've not been called to many hopes, but we've been called to one hope. What is that hope? Well, Titus 1.2 Paul writes, in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. In hope of eternal life. You know, Maxie and I uh, were serving at the same funeral Saturday. And uh, that was a dear brother, an elder in the church, who was a very fine man, one of Maxie's best friends. Uh, wh what is it? Uh, that we have after this body ceases and is buried in the ground. The hope of eternal life. Peter writes and says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, verse 3 through 4. Notice he says we've got a living hope, not a dead hope. A living hope because Jesus, who is our hope, was resurrected from the dead. God has made reservations for you. I hope that you manage to get a hotel reservation. I understand that some people had great difficulty because of the blizzards and people couldn't get out on the airport and so there, was, there were some great problems. And you had to make a reservation to have a place here in Fort Worth. God's made your reservation if you're a Christian. If you're going to get some people to die for a cause that you have caused them to believe in, how do you get them to die for that cause? What would motivate them to die for that cause? What can you say to them that will encourage them to remain faithful? There is only one thing that you can give them, and that's hope after life. Or hope after death, after this life. Peter ends his first letter with, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 1 Peter 5.10 And John tells us, this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. 1 John 2.25 I've heard people say that there are 30,000 promises in the Bible. I'm not going to start counting. I've never counted. It doesn't matter. But if there's 29,999, God will keep every one. He himself made the promise. A Hebrew writer says, in order that by two unchangeable things in which it, is, which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope 
set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 6, 18 through, 18 through 20. The words there that he uses, sure and steadfast. Sure means fail negative. Negative, you will not fail. You will not fail. It will not fail. Steadfast is stable. It's firm. It's forceful. It's sure. We can be assured that God's promise will not fail and that the anchor is stable. Because we've got an anchor beyond the veil, Jesus. We're tied to Him. And as long as we're tied to Him, that hope is never going to fail. But you know, a lot of sermons uh, tell you what God wants and what we ought to be doing. But a lot of folks sit out there and say, well, how can I get a grip on this hope? How can I have this hope? And I'm not going to tell you how to become a Christian, yeah? But I just want to encourage you on just one or two nuts and bolts things that will make you think about it and perhaps increase your grip on this hope. We Christians ought to have hope. The Lord expects us to and wants us to possess that hope. Paul prayerfully exhorts the Romans with, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may Abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Abound in hope. Romans 15 verse 13. We Christians ought to be people that abound in hope. We've got a lot of it. We don't need negative Nellies going around the neighborhood say, well, you know, why don't you become a Christian? There's nothing else to do. I mean, you can't trust the government right now. They can't even pay guys who are working for them. You know, there's no hope. There's a little bit of hope in Christianity. We want people who are bound in hope. He prays for the Ephesians. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Ephesians 1.18. So how do we increase this hope? Well, number one, we need to read the scriptures. I work for a clothing chain family store in Africa. And uh, one of the things we did was we, we had a lot of budget. It was a budget. It was a very good store. And, and uh, you know, they could tell you how many times a, a salesman coughed last year, you know. Uh, you know, they, they had a lot of good records. If you don't know where you've been, you can't tell where you're going to go. And so they were very good at that. And when one of those stores started to uh, operate below budget, anticipated, expected budget, we knew that it was basically one simple thing. They weren't performing according to policy. Because the company's policy was proven in that part of Africa, in southern Africa. 600 stores, the policy worked. And so what we'd go, do is go in there and we'd examine, uh, you know, are you giving the customers, uh, when, you, when they pay for their pay their their, their installment on their account, it was a six months revolving account, are you showing them that they have $50 credit to buy? Are you doing this basic? Are you doing that basic? The nuts and bolts. Usually it was the nuts and bolts. And I'm telling you what, folks, in Christianity it's the same thing. When things are going wrong, when people haven't got hope or some other quality they ought to have or possess, it's because of the nuts and bolts. And reading the scriptures is one of them. For whatsoever... Whatsoever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. The encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. How come we have hope because of the scriptures? Well, when I look back there, I see people battling sin. I see David and Goliath and I see who wins and I see whose side he's on. And again and again. Like one preacher said, I've read the end of the book, and we win. I mean, it's that simple, isn't it? Just skip to the end. We win. 
But the trouble is, the devil has the appearance of winning, doesn't he? He always has the appearance of winning. Your next door neighbor seems to be winning. They've got a Mercedes, you've got a VW. It seems like they're winning. But you forget, I've got the hope of eternal life. This guy's the loser. We've got to trust in God. We are God's people and we are the ultimate victors without a doubt. You know, Revelation depicts the, the struggle between the church and Rome. And what happened to the mighty power of Rome? Well, you can go and visit the ruins. What happened to Christ's church? Still here. Still here. Remains victorious because it's the kingdom that will never be destroyed. Daniel 2.44. You know, Daniel, I found him to be more correct the more I read him. <laughs> Scriptures give us hope because we read of impossible situations being overcome. Empty lives being filled. God's plans coming to fruition. Especially through the weakest of vessels. You were going to save the world. You and I, we might have tried it a different way. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have sent the hope of Israel in the body of a little child. Why? Somebody might kill him. And indeed they tried. But then, do we always understand the power of God or believe it? That gives me hope. If I don't read the scriptures, I'm not going to be encouraged by the scriptures to have that hope. Don't read the newspaper. Read God's word. It's got better news. Num number two, believe that God wants to bless you. Unfortunately, sometimes in Christianity, we can get onto the negatives that are, and there's certainly some things, the warnings, admonitions, very, very strong ones. And we can get on that kind of negative role. And we forget that God ultimately wants to bless us, that he loves us and desires us to live with him. You know, God's the only one in this universe who has said, I want everybody to come and live with me. Have you ever thought of doing that? We must not forget the Lord's righteous character. God is a God of grace and mercy. Righteous art thou who art and who wast, O Holy One, because thou didst judge these things. Revelation 16, 5. God is righteous. When we lived in Rhodesia, Africa, well, we left in 1978 because we had a communist problem, as, as Maxie said. And um, oh, about two years later, 1980, uh, through negotiations with the British government and what have you, um, they had some elections and a socialist communist government uh, took power. The president, present prime minister is an avowed Marxist, actually, and it's kind of a weird situation there. It's kind of half capitalism, half socialism. But soon after they took power, one of the prime minister's leading thugs, and uh, you know, that's what he was, I'm afraid. I mean, he was a communist guerrilla. Those guys did some pretty bad, pretty bad things. He decided that he wants some guy's farm outside the capital, outside the capital city, Harare. So he sent some of his men there to kill the farmer. They killed the wrong guy by mistake on the wrong farm, you know. But anyway, the police were still pretty good at that time, and they investigated the incident, and uh, they found out who did it, arrested them, including this guy who was a minister of something, put him in jail. Now, in Rhodesia, when you killed somebody, you got the death sentence. And usually you had a trial, and within 30 to 90 days, something like that, if you were found to be guilty, you were hung by the neck until you were dead. The prime minister canceled the death sentence. Got his friend out of jail, and I guess he's still there. That's not a righteous thing. That's not righteous. But God is righteous. He does no wrong, and he is also gracious and merciful as his word testifies. We have been justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus and we don't deserve it. But God is righteous. 
We should be praising him for his great blessings. We should believe that he wants to bless us as an earthly father, as any earthly father would. But more so, as Jesus explained in Matthew 7. It's inherent in the nature of God to love and to give and to bless. And that should engender hope within us. And we should wake up every morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your great blessings. We need to expect great things from a great God. Number three, we need to give our best service to God. Paul wrote to Timothy, Make every effort to come to me soon. Make every effort to come to me soon. Do your best to come to me quickly. The Lord wants people to give their best. Because people who give their best have a better grip on hope. Someone who's acting in a slovenly way before God, uh, you know, that's a ragtag hope that they have. They're never satisfied with what they're doing. They're never happy with their relationship with God. And it has a way of kind of decreasing your hope. In your own heart at least. A lot of people give up hope because they give up on doing their best. Mary Crowley of Home Interiors and Gifts said, One person with a belief is worth more than 99 who merely have an interest. Read with me Romans chapter 5 verse 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. What if things are difficult and painful? Actually, those things increase the hope of a person who is striving to serve God. Just increase it. Don't diminish it. Hard times make people stronger, not weaker. And as Christians prove their faith and Character in the eye of the storm, their hope and confident expectation rise to greater levels than before. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 9 through 12, the Hebrew writer says, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. That you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The same diligence. Don't be sluggish so that you can have the full assurance of hope. Peter and Paul exhibited that kind of diligence in their work, in their service, and in their letters. They showed diligence and realized that full assurance of hope until the end. Turn again to uh, 2 Timothy in chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. And here Paul speaks of it, where he talks almost like the sacrifice, the Jewish sacrifice, when he says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What did Paul do? Paul gave all diligence to what he was supposed to do and he was assured of that hope within himself until the end. He said, I'm sure of where I'm going. Why? I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. If we want to get a grip on hope, we need to have that kind of attitude. And then fourthly, we need to look for the good things. 
I may be one of the only ones in this lectureship that finishes before time. But I'm not going to apologize for that. Some people look for the gloomy side. You know, there's always something wrong. You go out there and say, boy, it's a beautiful crisp morning. No, it's too cold. I mean, no matter what you say, they've got something downer to say about it. And like old Thomas, his name became synonymous with doubt. Well, you know, the Lord was raised. Well, uh, I don't know about that, man, you know. John tells how Jesus was going to go and raise Lazarus. Thomas says, let us also go that we may die with him. John 11 verse 6. Now there was an element of real uh, probability of them being hurt there. But old Thomas, he's got a bad sort of, you know, doubting attitude there. Well, okay, I believe, let's go with them. I'm still on Jesus' side, but I'm telling you, we're going to die. Later on, when the other disciples tell them, we've seen the Lord, he says, I want to see the raw evidence. I want to see the raw evidence. And perhaps fails to experience the surge of hope that he should have had at their announcement. He kills the announcement. Don't have him at a surprise party. You know, <laughs> Thomas says, surprise. But I, I suppose you knew anyway. You know, He's going to take all the hope out of life, you know. Some people give up too easily and in difficult times will remark, well, there's nothing we can do. But even when God's prophets spoke of the destruction of his people because of their sin, and you're going into Babylon, then they break into the glorious pictures of the kingdom to come. They saw the good even amongst the bad. Because with God... There is always hope. Many years ago, an analysis was made of 100 self-made millionaires. They ranged in age from 21 to 70, and their education ranged from grade school to PhD. And that's interesting. 70% came from towns of 15,000 or less. 70%. They had all, all had one thing in common. They were good finders. They found good in people. They found good in situations. They found good in the future. They looked for good. They saw good. They pointed it out. They grabbed the good. They ran with it. I think we've got to do the same. To maintain a grip on hope and eternal life, it helps to cultivate the habit of seeing the best in others and every situation. We need to see the best in others. Don't believe what David Miller said about Johnny Ramsey. I like Johnny. I, was, I met him many years ago, and I still like him in spite of uh, knowing him. Well. <laughs> now, I've got into it. You see, the, it's bad to start that sort of stuff. No. We need to see the good in others. As perhaps Max, he saw in me and invited me here to speak, and I appreciate that very much. There's only one kind of hopeless situation, and... I'm sure the brethren who are here today know these scriptures well, but I'm going to read them anyway. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. This describes a very sad situation. And I say a hopeless situation. If it's hopeless if people remain this way. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What a tremendous blessing, but what a tremendous fear to be without God in this world, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. I don't want to be in that kind of situation. And I don't want you to be in that kind of situation. I don't want my neighbor to be in that kind of situation, in a hopeless situation, locked in by ignorance or pride or conceit or whatever that stops them from obeying the gospel and gripping the hope that God has so abundantly given us. 
Many years ago in a mental institution outside Boston, a young girl was locked in a dungeon. Apparently that's what they did in mental institutions. That's so sad. It's terrible. But this young girl was, was so bad that they had to lock her in a cage in the dungeon in the mental institution. She was a hopeless case, and uh, they kind of threw her food to her, basically, passed it into the cage. There was one nurse who was retiring, and she kind of took this little girl on as a project. She, she just felt sorry for her and uh, would go down there and talk to her or just sit there, and she left her some brownie cookies one day. This young girl would often attack the people that came into the cage or certainly... If she didn't do that, she would ignore them. But the next day, the cookies were gone, so she left some more. And the young girl kept on taking what she left. She became friends with her, worked with this young girl, and eventually they took her out the cage. And then they took her upstairs. She graduated. And eventually, this young girl called Annie, they said, you can leave. You can leave the institution. She said, no, I want to stay here and help people. Her name was Annie Sullivan, Helen Keller's teacher. Wow, what a story. What a hopeless situation. But somebody saw the good. Somebody saw the hope. Somebody loved her. You know, the Lord's done that for us. What are we trying to say? Don't give up on others. Don't give up on self. And certainly don't give up on God, because He never gives up on you. With God, there is always hope. And He has promised us this one hope, that He's going to come back and take us home.